Our scripture passage this morning comes from Colossians 1, uh, verses 11 through 20. And I experience it as an invitation, and I invite you to receive it uh, the same. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the creator who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. I want you to hear that word inheritance. Inheritance of the saints of light. Christ has rescued you, uh, us, from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been made through him and for him. Christ himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to God's self all things, whether on earth or in heaven by making peace through the blood of his cross. Invitational words, I hope they are received. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God who makes love visible, be in the words spoken and in the words heard this morning that we might sense our oneness with you in Christ. In the way of Christ we pray. Amen. So, I've been thinking about this thing for quite a bit over several of decades. And I've come to be thoroughly convinced that we have been taught to see the invisible the wrong way. Now, if that statement sounds a little confusing, let me say it again so that it becomes completely confusing. We have been taught to see the invisible the wrong way. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourselves, but isn't that the point of something being invisible? It can't be seen. Well, yes and no. Being seen is just one element. Yes, it can't be seen, but there's more to it than that. And I want to dig into that a little bit today. And at the end of our conversation today, I hope that you either leave questioning or are affirmed by the idea that the nature of invisibility is that while something may be unseen, it does not mean that it is necessarily unsensed. That is, if something could be unseen, but it does not mean that it is unsensed. You can perceive it. So I'll never forget when my instructor said to my class on the first day of military tech school for satellite communications, in order to do this job well, he said, you have to be able to see the invisible. He went on to introduce us to the world of frequencies, and throughout the course, he explained the nature of unseen waves and their different characteristics and how all of the instruments that humans use to enhance our ability to see the unseen are based on functionality of either the human body or what we observe from other creatures in nature. But the very philosophical question uh, that he and I discussed and that has been working on me for decades now is, how do we know to look for these invisible frequencies in the first place? Think about that. How do we know to look for these invisible frequencies in the first place? It would make no sense to create a tool to find something that you didn't suspect was there. And even deeper of a question that he and I talked about outside of class was, is it possible that what we are looking for wants to be found just as much as we want to find it. And I'll let you hang out with that. <laughs> now, as I said, I've been thinking about this for decades and have been doing my best to figure out how to articulate this in a transmittable way. 
but I'm not quite there yet, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me. So one day, after prayer, meditation, and contemplation, which is so important on this journey, uh, I was contemplating some of these ideas, and I started to think about our teaching and our tradition that says that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And we've heard that before, and we've said those words uh, plenty of times. And without going into the long train of thought that got me here, I arrived at the thought of, if God is invisible, and I am in the image of likeness of God, then I must be invisible too. And so I said to myself, I am invisible. Now, at first, follow this train with me. <laughs> now, at first, I thought about the cartoonish idea of invisible. A hat and a shirt and some glasses maybe floating around that demonstrate my invisibility. But from there, the idea expanded when I considered that in many ways, I had experienced invisibility my entire life. And it wasn't because my body wasn't seen, but rather it was precisely because my body was seen that the greater part of who I am was rendered invisible. And I bet each and every one of you uh, knows what that's like in your own context and in your own ways. And so emboldened by this awareness, I decided to embrace my invisibility and amazing things started to happen. Now, being guided by the two great commandments that invite us to love God and neighbors as ourselves, I des desired the likeness of being that came over me for everyone. And so I went out about my day, and I would say to myself, to, thinking of every person, and I would say, that person is invisible. That person is invisible, and that person is invisible. And what this did was it freed me from any supposition that I could tell anything about anyone simply from looking at their bodies, just as I would not want people to suppose that they know me or anything about me simply from looking at mine. But more than that, the practice reminded me that behind everyone and everything, there is a story of how they came into the world that I don't know unless they tell me. And so I extended my witnessing to the invisible nature of everything. That tree is invisible. My car is invisible. My phone is invisible. This church is invisible. And suddenly, the world was full of wonder. From there, my mind went to Hebrews 11, which is all about faith. And specifically, I thought about verses 1 through 3, which say, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen this and this and this and this the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible the invisible brought about the visible so think about that everything we see is made of things that we cannot see too often we take for granted that the visible world tells most of the story but how often do we think about how little we see in the world like the proverbial tip of the iceberg, we only see a small portion of what is actually here. But this notion goes even deeper than that. It says that even if you see the rest of the iceberg, there is infinitely more than you cannot see that allow the iceberg to even come into being. It says if we see that the real thing is just a what well, we call the real thing, is just a shadow of the real world that we cannot see. The world of God that pours out into our world when we come face to face with the light. In James 1, it says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above or beyond and comes from the Father, the Creator, the Mother of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Can you consider the possibility that almost everything about you that can be seen or observed in any way only says as much about who you really are as a shadow 
when the sun is at your back? What if you and all that you can sense through your corporeal and cognitive means says almost nothing about the magnificence from which you emerge? James called God the father of lights, or in inclusive language, the mother of lights, the creator of lights, whatever allows you to receive it, because I would love for you to receive it. Jesus told his listeners that they were the light of the world, that light that you and we all come from and everything that we cannot see. Our faith tells us that. And when, when we forget it, it's because we are putting our faith in shadows. But we are more than shadows, or what some may call the ego. But the question we have to ask ourselves is if we are ready to see who we really are. In Hebrews 10, it says, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year after year make perfect those who approach. That is to say that the law, the things that we do, they're just a shadow of a greater thing. And because there's a greater thing beyond it, the shadow cannot reveal the reality of who we are. It cannot make us perfect, if you will. But how cool is that? Way before people were talking about quantum physics and making it's this kind of terminology into our everyday lives, there were some people who were already going around telling people that everything we see is made out of things that we cannot see. For those of you who know Kevin Pettit in our community, he and I were talking about how to talk about this in a sermon, and we were like, oh man, it's kind of hard to talk about nothingness and void and zero and all these other things. We had a good time, and I wish you were here to, to kind of coach me on this one a little bit. He's a physicist for those of you who don't know. But he agreed with me that centuries before the book of Hebrews was ever written, there was an understanding that the power of the invisible was infinitely beyond the power of that which is seen. The unknown more powerful than the known. When Paul described God to the people of Athens, he pointed to them their own ideas of the unknown God who they worshipped without knowing. Sure, some people may have tried to write some of the guys off as uh, idolaters, but hey, they were smart as all get out. Greek philosophers like Lucifus and Democritus, who came up with the atomic theory, were arguing against other thinkers who contemplated an all-powerful void out of which all things emerged. My point is that people knew that the really real could not be found in the limited manifestations that we make the end-all and be-all of life. They were looking for that which is greater that was within them. As John said, greater is the one within you than the one who is in the world. Now, there are a lot of interpretations of that scripture, but the way I take it is that the invisible one, Christ, your inheritance that lives within you, is there and present, even though it might not be seen in the world. But it can be sensed. A recent criticism I heard about religion is that it does not seem to produce beings like unto the type of the founders of those religions. In other words, Christianity does not produce Christ. Buddhism does not produce Buddhas. And so on. And the critic said that if any other program did not produce people who were clearly on the path to do what the teacher could do, we would consider those programs as failing. And I agree with that critic. We are called to be like Christ. As it says elsewhere, as Christ is, so are we in the world. And one of my favorite people to quote C.S. Lewis said, Now the whole offer of Christianity, of which Christianity makes, is this. That we can, if we let God have God's way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, we shall then be sharing a life which was begotten not made, which always existed and always will exist. We call Christ the Son of God. If we share in this kind of life, we also shall be children of God. We shall love the Creator as the Creator does, or as Christ does, and the Holy Spirit will arise in us. Christ came to this world and became a human in order to spread to other humans the kind of life that Christ had 
by what C.S. Lewis called a good infection. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. Unfortunately, many of us have seemed to have forgotten or have no awareness of this invisible greatness within us. We think that if we will ever be great, we'll be at some time in the future. And we don't realize that we inhabit and are filled with that greatness right now. One of the things that's common to say in our world is, fake it till you make it. I say, throw that away. Because if you practice being fake, only fake is going to come out. Rather, I say, be it until you see it. Be it until you see it. Accept who you are. Accept the reality of God's love indwelling in you. That God sees you as a sufficient habit, inhabitant for God's own being. And then be it in the world until you see it and witness it into yourself. The only reason I can see that we can't see that right now is perhaps maybe we don't want to see it in others. But I say, see it and then give it away. One of the most popular archetypes in human storytelling is the rag the riches archetype. And it doesn't matter how many times or how many ways it's told, we tend to love it. In fact, I would say that that is the American story in particular, going from poverty to in obscurity and perhaps even being oppressed by some person or system, but somehow by sheer force of will and determination, we rise up from our low estate and become respected and perhaps even intimidating and imposing. And Americans love that. For example, consider Edmond Dantes from Alexander Dumas's Count of Monte Cristo. If you haven't read it, it's a great story. A sailor is on his way to living a great life, but then he gets thrown into prison forever. But then he meets this man, and in that prison, that man tells him about a plan for escape and about a treasure that's on the other end. But when that cellmate dies, Edmund escapes by getting into the body bag with the cellmate and being thrown into the ocean. The cellmate's death is the gateway to Edmund's redemption and freedom, enabling him to return home and reclaim the life he almost lost. Kind of analogous to the Christian story, if you think about it, that someone else's death gave this person their freedom and offered them a treasure. And doesn't it sound exciting? But that is the story of our souls. Imagine, and this is what one of my personal critiques of religion, is imagine that someone found out your true identity. And they knew that we were given an inheritance, but instead of telling us that our parent had given us access to all of their resources, they told us, hey, I know you thought you were no one, and I have some good news for you. You actually were the child of this like great person and everything, and they left you $300. And then they kept the rest for themselves, and they let you come and beg for a little bit here and there, when the reality is you have access to it all. That's the invitation. Jesus' story is the reverse of the rags and riches story. It's the idea that someone went from everything to nothing to meet those who thought they were in nothing to reveal to them that they had access to everything. And that's the story that we celebrate here. That's your story. That's all of our story. And the greatest way to receive that story is to give it away, to express it. In each and every one of us, there is an invisible reality built on relationships and built on so many things. And the world is waiting for you to express it. To express means to just put it out there. To give you an analogy, a synopsis, or something, an anonym to expression, depression means to press down. Oppression means to press against and suppress means to press under. Whenever that energy, that reality of who you are does not get expressed, we act it out in those three ways. We either get depressed for not expressing, we oppress others to keep them from expressing, or we try to suppress that expression. But if we express the reality of who we are, we create an invitation for all beings. I'll leave you with this. Before my father died, I had an opportunity to interview him and ask him some questions. And I asked him what was his biggest regret. And he said, 
that I thought I was alone. All of my life, I lived as if I was alone. I made decisions as if I was alone. I did harmful things because I acted like I was alone in the world. If there was one thing I would do differently, I would realize that I was always in relationship. Whether it was another person or the highest relationship, which is us and God. And so I leave you with this poem that's a take on the Lord's Prayer. And I call it Our Guardian, whose art is heaven. And this is the imagining that God is an artist expressing God's inner being out into the world. Our guardian who art, whose art is heaven and on every other plane. Thanks for calling us into being and holding us in your name. We seek to find your kingdom. We live for it to come a world beyond division where all are known as one. A place of infinite creation where all that's good will last, our future and our hope without the burdens of the past. Thy will for us is done by your heaven-born design as soon as we surrender and walk the narrow line. By your word, you feed us daily with everything we need, satisfying holy hungers that this world can never feed. You share the joy of your forgiveness by instructing we do it too, forgiving others when they trespass, for they know not what they do. This frees us from temptation, from error we are delivered. We enter into the kingdom when we imitate the giver. In that state, we behold your glory and your unassuming power that's been our light in a world of darkness, preparing us for our hour. You've been creating us in your image though invisible it may be, teaching us to practice the art of heaven that only opened eyes can see. Go out into the world expressing what is already true for you and be it till you see it, until others see it too. Thanks be to God.